Lord, may we, as you said in your word, be soft and light, be active in this community in which we live and in this, our nation. So, Lord, we ask your blessings be upon this night, and we pray this in your precious name. Amen. 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 Well, the guy really who is uh, the head of all this and put all this together is Dr. Andy Danielli, and I want to invite him here tonight. Give him a hand if you would. Pastor Dan, and um, what I'd like to do is, as we did last time, just let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance, so if you could all stand, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you. Before I bring Mr. Lonigan out, there's a few things that I wanted to say about what we're doing here, what we're going to do in two weeks from now, just so you know, because once Mr. Lonigan's up, he's going to finish the program. Um, we're going to end in a prayer after that from one of the guys from the church. We're going to, we missed something last week. We're going to sing God Bless America afterwards. That'll be good, right? All right, so let me, if you, have, if you weren't here two weeks ago, we're doing a series here at the church, but this is sort of outside the church, and I want to hit you with the disclaimer first. This is not a political thing as far as we're not endorsing Republicans, can, uh, Democrats, any kind of candidate. This is just what we're doing. As Pastor Dan said, the country is in bad shape and we need to turn the ship around. And instead of just getting angry, instead of just yelling at your TV, or instead of just doing, you know, emails back and forth, what we're going to do twice a month from now until November and maybe after, I don't know Pastor Dan, is uh, we're going to um, give people actual tools that they can use to make a difference. All right, we're going to do that uh, in a really uh, systematic way. But before I do that, I want to just spend a second. I want to thank Pastor Dan for opening up the church. You know, it took a lot of us to do this. And <laughs> And if you don't go to church, or if you'd just like to visit, he rocks when he's, when he's preaching. If you want to hear some good Bible-based preaching, you should come here. Um, now, I want to say what we're doing here tonight is going to be great. What we're going to do in two weeks is also going to be really good. And you need to be here two weeks from today. Now, it's the day after Labor Day. It's the first Tuesday of the month. It's the day after Labor Day, so it's going to be a challenge. But what I'm going to ask you to do is all get on board to bring people with you because we're going to be going over the First Amendment. We're going to have um, Rich Mastriano speaking. He's a really good speaker. He's from North Jersey. And he's going to go over our, relig our religious rights, how we're losing them, and what we can do to, to not lose them. Right, he's a great speaker. Many of you have heard him before. And you want to be there for that. I'm going to be speaking a little bit on what you can do. Remember I told you two weeks ago, I'm going to teach you how to fight a little dirty? I'm going to teach you that in two weeks. And part of it is to be able to speak out in the public. So I'm going to give you a little heads up. After next rally's session, you're going to want to get one of these t-shirts. Some of you already have them. These are our First Amendment t-shirts. It says, exercise your First Amendment rights while you still can. All right. We have some that you can get out at the back. You want to get them on your way out so you don't have to get them next week. You're going to want to have them. All right? They come in a packet. In the packet, you'll have some literature, some things that you can hand out. And there's also a pocket constitution. It's only $19 for the whole thing. You do cash, credit card, whatever you want to do. But they'll be on your way out. Um, we're going to pass around a list. If you're not on our email list, please get on it so we can tell you what's going on in the next few rallies, and um, we're going to hand out a flyer for, for two weeks from now, for the 4th, and uh, Leanne's got some, and just, we're going to hand, hand a bunch of them out to be passed down the roads, take as many as you think you could hand out, 
And if you want to get a little practice, wear your t-shirt the next few weeks, have some flyers in your pocket. When people say, hey, I like your t-shirt, we are losing our First Amendment rights. And I say, you got to come to this church. It's a really good thing to do. You, you're not going to want to miss it. If you don't like it, I'll bring you to Chick-fil-A and uh, get you dinner. All right? That's been my guarantee. You bring anybody here two weeks from now, if they are completely happy they came, tell them I will personally bring them to Chick-fil-A. All right? And um, that's all I wanted to say. But in two weeks from now, oh, I almost forgot. We're also going to have, and I didn't really even know about this guy until a few days from uh, a few days ago, but since I've been talking to people, a lot of people do know him, and he's excellent. And some of you may not know. Has anybody ever heard uh, Reverend Steve Kraft? Okay, really dynamic preacher, and he's going to be coming in, and he's going to be talking about a lot of the First Amendment things that we're going to be covering. You don't want to miss two weeks from now, and please, please bring your friends. What we're doing here is, you may think is a small thing. But you don't know what a ripple effect this can have and how it can affect other people. And I'm just going to share one short story and then I hand it over to um, Mr. Lonigan. I was wearing another t-shirt, a little bit more provocative at Costco um, one day. And uh, like I was doing, handing out information. And a few months went by and I was working on someone's campaign. And uh, there was about 10 of us at a meeting. And, uh, this woman across the table from me kept looking at me, and I was sort of looking at her like, where do I know you from? And then, you know how it is. After a few minutes, I said, where do I know you from? Like, another meeting, a tea party thing, whatever? And she was all proud. She goes, I was waiting for you to ask me. I said, okay, fill me in. She goes, I work at Costco. And you were wearing one of your t-shirts, like that one you're wearing, and you handed me a flyer. And I took it home, and I read it, and I said, you know what? I'm tired of yelling at my TV, I'm tired of not doing anything. And then she started rattling off all the different things that she started to do as far as action steps and things that she... And it just goes to show you, just sharing a little bit can go such a long way and make a huge difference. All right, so I congratulate all of you here today because you're taking an action step to actually do something that's positive, something that's going to make a change. And I promise you, we are going to make a change and we are going to save this country. Right. Yeah. Now, our speaker, I first heard about him a few years ago when he was running uh, for governor. And um, I heard him speak, and I was like, you're kidding. We're actually going to have someone like this to vote for in New Jersey? I can't believe it. And I was thrilled, and I, and I worked a little bit on his campaign, and I, I, I talked to all my friends say, you to vote for Steve Lonigan, it's really good. And um, I can go on and on as far as Steve's accomplishments, uh, mayor of Bogota, and the things that he did as a mayor, but really the things that he's doing now um, are really incredible as far as giving people information and tools to actually make a difference. You know, we need leaders in our movement if we're going to save this country. And Steve is a leader. And the thing that impresses me most, and I can tell you from my experience as far as talking in front of people, you know, if you have a room full of people, you know, it's exciting and, it, you know, you, you get the energy from the crowd. But I'm guilty. If there's only a few people, you know, that showed up, I was like, I have a hard time getting enthused about it. I have seen Steve Lonigan in front of thousands of people in Washington, D.C., and I've seen him in the parking lot of a diner on a bus tour with a handful of people, and he speaks with the same enthusiasm, he speaks with the same energy, and he just has so much to share with us, so I'm not going to take any more time. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Lonigan. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Doctor, very much for all of your work in organizing events like this, and thank you to uh, Pastor... Dan Brindley and his wife Stephanie in the Cross Point Church for hosting us today and being brave in doing that. But before I start my presentation, and I'm going to go off from a little bit from my normal presentation and talk about faith. Um, but we're here at a church, and uh, I want to tell you, I come from a very devout Catholic family. I'm an Italian Catholic family, have vivid images of my grandmother kneeling in front of 
the crucifix in her, her bedroom, and uh, I put both my daughters through Catholic grammar school, high school, and college. Um, and I thank my stars every day for the fact that Protestants formed this country. That's an interesting comment, right? And I'll tell you why it's so critical. The United States of America was primarily found by Protestants. And they formed this great constitution and wrote the Declaration of Independence. It was only one Catholic signer to the United States Constitution. That was William Carrollton from Maryland. But you know, because the Protestant church doesn't have one pope, one single central power, they believed in this division of powers, in the separation of powers, not having one king, not in forming a nation in which we had a decentralized government, just like there's a decentralized churches amongst the Protestant sects. That was critical to the history of this nation, actually critical to the formation of America. As a Catholic, had Catholics formed the country, we very well have had a central power. Because that's the formation of the Catholic Church, so I'm very thankful. But look at America, right? We have this church, this nation founded on Judeo-Christian beliefs, like Pastor Bridley said, on the beliefs that we are endowed by our Creator with sudden and all the rights. A Creator means God, it doesn't mean government, it doesn't mean some, you know, amorphous mass of electronic elements that decides what rights we have. And, and the nation is founded in... in Many Puritans, Protestants from the, the colonies, and then they welcome the Catholics. Catholics come right after that. And then they welcome the Jews, and the Jews come right in the heels of that. They're welcome to come into our communities and set up synagogues. And this every town in this country has a some sort of a church. And I was over in Morristown Sunday. You go on the Morristown Square, a very historic place. There's an Episcopalian church, a Presbyterian church, a Catholic church, and there's a Jewish synagogue right around the corner. That was America. And then they welcomed the Buddhists. And then we welcome Hindus, and we welcome Muslims. We're very welcoming in religious diversity. And then came this other group called the Atheists. And they weren't very welcoming, were they? They decided suddenly that we're all wrong. And suddenly, we as a nation have to accept their beliefs and turn against our very own. You know, today as Americans, we wonder why there are so many teen pregnancies, the use of drugs and violence in our inner cities. Well, why do we wonder so much? The nation was pretty stable up through World War II. And I think the beginning came about 1962 when the United States Supreme Court suddenly said we can't pray in schools because that group of atheists are offended. We don't want to offend them. We used to share prayer. I prayed in school. One week it would be a Jewish prayer, one day it would be a Catholic prayer. Young children shared those ideas. We learned from each other. I had an Egyptian Coptic in my first grade classroom. It was pretty interesting. But so along comes the U.S. Supreme Court and they say, no, no, we can't have prayer in schools. We can't share the Bible in schools. Then, I don't know if you remember a few years later, Dr. Spock. Yeah. Remember Dr. Benjamin Spock? He came along and said, you know, this idea of spanking your children, you can't do that. We have to worry about their self-esteem. We can't teach them our values. They have to learn on their own as they grow up organically. Mm, yeah. Then, of course, there was this other decision called Roe versus Wade. Yeah. Suddenly, the value of human life is right. demeaned and degraded. And then comes this all-out assault on the sacred matrimony, the, the institution of marriage. Yeah. So as we watch this sort of 40-year devolution, from a nation based on Judeo-Christian values, on fundamental principles. I've always said you can learn everything you need to know to govern the Bible. We wonder what happened. I think it's very simple, folks. You, uh, you reap what you sow. Uh -huh. And as a society, I think we're reaping what we sow. And we're starting to see that come to light even more in the last several years. In the unraveling of our society, the value of our families, and the loss of our freedom in many, many ways. Freedom that was believed based on the fact that we are endowed by our Creator with certain our and other rights, not our, by our fellow man, and that our fellow man can't take those rights away from us. Tonight I want to focus on one fundamental aspect of freedom and liberty, and that's economic freedom. Um, and economic freedom is something that, as an economist, I've heard of the concept many, many times over the years, but I have never heard it used as much as I've seen and heard in the last two years in the media. Where I hear politicians on both sides of the aisle talking about something called economic freedom, economic liberty, commentators, even people like Rachel Maddow, I've heard her, she doesn't know what it means, but she says it anyway. <laughs> and others, and um, 
So what is economic freedom? We're going to focus on economic freedom. Economic freedom is liberty of the individual to make the decisions that are best in their own self-interest. By the way, New Jersey's motto, liberty and prosperity, means very simply that you cannot have prosperity without liberty, without equal protection under the law for all individuals endowed by their creator to make the decisions they want on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's talk about what economic freedom means. And the best model I know of to explain economic liberty is the state of New Jersey. This state, I think, is the preeminent model for the rest of the nation on how a nation can flourish and be prosperous and how it can diminish through bad government policies that undermine the freedom of the individual. So I want to take you on a little history tour and a little economics lesson. Dan said I had to keep this to two and a half hours, so make sure you're comfortable. <laughs> Let's talk about the great state of New Jersey. You know, I think for virtually everybody in this room, we've watched New Jersey in our lifetimes decline from the nation's number one economy to number 50 in our very lifetimes. You have to wonder why. What happened to this state while you and I were working and going to school that suddenly watched it so slowly diminish as we forfeited our liberties? Well, I can, I'm going to lay that out to you, I hope and then how we compare to the rest of the world. That's my goal in the next 30 or so, so minutes. So I'm going to take you through the state of New Jersey. My, my staff and I have spent a lot of time researching New Jersey's history and various elements of it. So I want to start our journey in the year 1776. New Jersey was the crossroads of the American Revolution. More battles were fought in the state of New Jersey than any other state. More time was spent here by Washington than any other state. The revolution turned at the Battle of Trenton, Christmas 1776. That was the turning point of the American Revolution. So we can honestly say that America was born right here in this state and right here in this county, the Battle of Monmouth being one of those key counties and others. 1776, New Jersey, from 1776 through the agricultural era right till the Industrial Revolution, New Jersey led the nation in agricultural growth. This was the number one state in the nation in agricultural export, agricultural productivity, productivity of wealth. Our farms were the most productive. Um, and most people don't know that. New Jersey uh, produced and exported more than any of the state, which is hard to believe, but it's the fact we had those great harbors at both ends of the state, from New York, Port Elizabeth, down to Camden. So New Jersey leads the nation in agricultural growth, right through to the industrial. I'll stop to tell you a little interesting story, because one of the folks, things that have made New Jersey a very powerful state is the fact that we have so many small towns and villages. That has made us economically prosperous. Counter to the big, big government advocates who are going to talk to you every day about how we have to get rid of all these small towns and villages, we have too many little towns. Nonsense. Absolutely not the case. It's quite the opposite. <coughs> Let me give you a funny little story. In 1807, there was a big battle in the county of Essex over whether or not to make Elizabeth or Newark the capital of Essex County. Up until 1807, in the state of New Jersey, women voted in legislative races, local races. They didn't vote for the federal level. So in 1807, they're going to have this big, well, they have this all-out battle in Newark. Turns out way more vote. Actually, actually in Newark, in that election, 276% of the eligible male population voted in that election. <laughs> so nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. But according to the newspaper report at the end of the election, this is what they actually reported. That in Newark, uh, two and over two and a half for every one of the uh, uh, in a land, you know, eligible freeholders of land, male voters could vote. Women voted, slaves voted, and even Philadelphians voted in Newark. That's what they reported. <laughs> Elizabeth lost that race, but it was such a big mess that the state legislature convened an emergency session the following year, and the right of women to vote in legislative races was taken away. Now, women were not supposed to be allowed to vote in New Jersey until suffrage, right? Which was 1920. Fact is that in New Jersey, small towns and villages across New Jersey, women participated in, in local elections. Right? Their husbands weren't going to stop them. They'd go down to the town hall meeting and women would vote. They couldn't vote for legislature, but democracy is born in our small towns and villages, folks. And I think that model shows it. It wasn't until 1920 with suffrage that women had the right to vote in the New Jersey state legislative races and for Congress and, and for Senate. But for the years before that, they voted on the local level. That's my lesson about the, the importance of our small towns and democracy. 
So New Jersey leads the nation in agricultural development and agricultural growth. And then in around 19, 1820s, there's this major recession in, in the country. And, and New Jersey's hit like everybody else. But the central planners in Trenton now think that they have an answer to this recession. And they're going to make New Jersey an economic powerhouse. They have this brilliant government idea. They're going to create what I consider the first government stimulus package. They're going to invest in, they're going to intervene in the market. The government's going to invest in industry. Now, this brilliant idea, they're going to build a state-of-the-art canal system. And the canals are going to allow our farmers to move their product to market even faster. And the state government went out and they floated New Jersey's canal and railroad bonds, namely the canal bonds, to fund this canal system. And it was going to make us an economic powerhouse. So, Savings banks put their money in, widows put their money in, people invested their money into this promising New Jersey canal bonds and the great return was going to be, the canal bonds would be paid back by the revenue generated from this canal system was built all up through Hunterdon County, Mercer County, around Trenton and up that neck of the woods and reaching somewhat down here. You can still see remnants of it today. And the canals were built and, and the, the equivalent of tens of billions of dollars was borrowed and spent on this by the state government. And uh, they gave out all grants to politically connected businesses who were going to build factories along the canals. The canals opened in about 1836. But unbeknownst to the geniuses in Trenton, they didn't plan for a little invention called the railroad. And the railroad made the canals obsolete almost overnight. Bondholders were held holding the bag for their canal bonds. The new privately funded railroads came along, took the business out right out from under the canals, and the canals went bankrupt, and the canal bondholders lost their shares. People across New Jersey lost their life savings. You didn't have FDIC insurance back then, so the savings bank put all the money into this, went bankrupt. People who didn't have canal bonds lost their savings, and it led to a massive economic catastrophe on, on a scale never seen since in the state of New Jersey. People lost their homes, they lost their farms. So the response to this ridiculous government intervention into the marketplace and this belief by politicians that they could plan the economy, there was the 1844 Constitution, a little convention convened by the legislature to deal with these issues. This is very important, folks, to remember. You know, Pat, I mean, two things I want you to remember. In the 1844 Constitution, they put an end to the right of the New Jersey State Legislature to borrow money without approval of the voters of New Jersey. Politicians said the voters are smarter. Anytime they want to borrow money, they have to put it on the ballot and the voters have to approve it. Now, if the voters approve new borrowing, we're then putting up our entire state as collateral. The entire state becomes collateral so those bondholders can't lose their shirts. We as a generation say we're willing to mortgage our future. Politicians can't do it. The debt limitation clause of the Constitution became a model for the rest of the nation. Nations around the country mimicked the New Jersey for being fiscally conservative and putting in that debt limitation clause. The second thing they did, recognizing the importance of an education, the, co the New Jersey Constitution of 1844's Federal and Efficient Education Clause requires that we fund an education through local taxes for children between the ages of 5 and 18 years old. 5 and 18. Two things. State ledger cannot borrow without voter approval, and we provide an education for children between the ages of 5 and 18. We're going to get back to that in a few minutes. New Jersey recovers from the catastrophe of the 1830s because we are basically have great resources and great assets. Uh, and go come back to becoming a prosperous economy. Then comes the Industrial Revolution. And with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, the world was changed around the whole globe. People began to move from agricultural communities into cities and urban areas. Society changed. New Jersey led the nation in the transition from an agricultural society to a manufacturing, to an industrial society. We were the number one state in the country through the industrial level to, to the mid uh, 20th century in manufacturing and urban manufacturing. Our cities like Patterson, where they harness the power of the waterfalls to drive the most productive textile manufacturing in the world, to Camden with its deep water harbor, famous for its iconic Campbell Soup Company, 
to Elizabeth, Port Elizabeth, and Newark with its great shipping and industrial manufacturing, to Trenton, whose model was and is today, Trenton makes the world takes. You can still see that sign on the entrance to Trenton, although they're not making much of anything anymore. <laughs> New Jersey cities were so renowned for their ability to manufacture and produce that European leaders came here from Europe because that's where European leaders come from, <laughs> to study our cities and to learn from what we had done. These cities exploded in a free market economy where there were no zoning ordinances. New Jersey had no municipal land use laws, no fancy centralized master plans, no government master plan. The city, the state just grew organically. And it grew based on its local strengths and weaknesses. Patterson had the waterfalls. Camden had the deep water harbor. Trent was located right on the Delaware River in a great location. And they just grew. And, and then there was this explosion of immigration as New Jersey became a magnet for immigrants coming through Ellis Island, through Philadelphia, from many of our ancestors. And those cities and the state met the growing housing needs of this exploding population through a wide range of free market methods. In your cities, you had apartment buildings, townhouses, uh, homes, mansions, bungalows, shacks, two-family homes, housing, uh, 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 boarding homes, uh, trailer parks along the Jersey Shore, bungalows up in the hills, farms. And it worked. And it made New Jersey the most prosperous state in the nation. Right through the late 1890s, right after the Civil War. In the 1880s, Thomas Edison, moved his business from New York to New Jersey because New Jersey was a better state to do business. Um, at the turn of the century, 1899, there were more corporations formed in the state of New Jersey than any other state in the Union. We were the number one state in the nation to form a corporation, AT&T, Johnson & Johnson, and many other iconic American brands were formed in the state of New Jersey. 1910, 1920, 1930, towns and villages exploding across the state of New Jersey. Between 1880 and 1920 is when the majority of New Jersey small towns and villages were chartered. Why is that? The number one driving reason that so many towns were chartered in New Jersey was a very simple one. People in those towns wanted the right to educate their children their way and their values and on their principles. And that's why so many towns were chartered as the population grew in the 1890s. And one of the best models I can give you is my own hometown of Bogota, um, which was formed in 1895, when the very stubborn Dutch farmers of the little village of Bogota, which was part of Hackensack, said, we don't want our kids going to school with those big city slippers school in Hackensack. We don't like what they're teaching our children. We want to teach our children our values. We want to teach them about farming, we want to teach them about our faiths, we want to teach them the things we believe in. I find that remarkable, folks, that back then, when people drove buckboard wagons to work, when they heated their house with wood, they had to go shut, when you had to grow their own food, when you went to the barber to have a teeth pulled and there was no Novocaine, that to me is the freakiest part. <laughs> that people were so tough and so concerned about their kids, that they go out and charter their own town. They go out and charter their own town because they want to educate their children. They don't want the government central planners with their PhDs up in some ivory tower in Trent, New Jersey, telling them what curriculum to teach their kids. They educate their own kids, their way, circling right around their face and their churches and their beliefs and their community. That's the American dream. That's what it was to be an American. So we go to like many towns, 1895, they, they get their charter. And back then the state would push charter. Oh, you want a charter, we'll give it to you. Now forget it. There's no such thing. Now they want to use all the force they can to force these towns to merge. But anyway, so 1895, my little town of Wagoda says, all right, we're going to build our first school building. Uh, and we're going to build it with local property taxes. It's going to be a whopping $5,000 for a four-room big school building. And there was a big political battle. And... They decided to build a building. Well, I'll tell you what, we got our money's worth because that was 117 years ago and it's still our municipal building today. Wow. So you don't see governments getting their money's worth back like, like we did. But um, that was what America's made of. And that's why we have so many towns. So people 
1910-20, New Jersey is the number one state in the nation to move to. Right through the 1950s. Right into the 1960s. We lead the nation in every area of economic growth. Number one job growth, number one wage growth, number one business growth, number one population growth. 1960, I'm a little kid. New Jersey has no income tax, no sales tax. And we had about the 10th highest property taxes in the nation. This is where I'm going to start my, my visuals, folks, and, and, and our, our real story, because that was just a warm-up. We're going to go, my staff went back and dug up every state budget going back to the 1890s. And what we learned, as you can see in this chart, as from 1900 to about 1960, 1950 to 1960, New Jersey state spending, that's that sort of red burgundy line, is, uh, is consistent with property taxes. There's no income tax, there's no sales tax. State spending is sort of going along with the rate of inflation. It's down, ups and down a little bit here and there, but it's basically staying with inflation. Government is small to efficient. And all that time, New Jersey leads the nation in every single area of economic prosperity. Then comes the 1960s. In the early 1960s, we had this president named Lyndon Johnson. And he had this idea called the Great Society. <coughs> The Great Society would grow government-funded education, government-funded low-income housing, Medicare, Medicaid, an expansion of government interference into our, the health industry, uh, which Ronald Reagan warned us about. And at the same time, there was a governor in New Jersey named Richard Hughes who shared that vision. Richard Hughes wanted to grow New Jersey's government too. The government, he said, wasn't doing enough to provide housing, wasn't doing enough to fund education, wasn't doing enough to fund expanded welfare programs. Massive expansion of welfare programs that would begin in 19, the early 1960s. So, in the early 1960s, the advocates of big government told the people of New Jersey that we had a property tax crisis. Back then, we were about number 10 in the nation, property taxes, and no income and sales tax. And they advocated for an income tax, which they couldn't get through the legislature. And then they advocated for a sales tax. And they spent about five years fighting for a sales tax, claiming we had a property tax crisis, and claiming that if we got a sales tax, that that sales tax would end the property tax crisis. And by the way, this is what they said. They said, if you give us a sales tax, we'll end the property tax crisis, and we'll help keep seniors in their homes. The beginning of New Jersey's economic decline began on April 21, 1965, when the New Jersey State Legislature passed our first statewide broad-based tax, which was a 3% sales tax. And on the day they passed that sales tax, children were bust in from communities from across the state of New Jersey, suburban communities, and they wore big round buttons that said better education through taxation. And with the passage of the 3% sales tax, we were told that this was going to keep seniors in their homes, uh, and solve our property tax crisis. Now, it just so happens in 1966 when the property tax kicks in, New Jersey's third in the nation in property taxes behind Connecticut and, and Cal Massachusetts and California, but we have no income in sales tax. But now look what's happening, folks. Watch my chart. You know that red line of state spending? 1966, it starts spiraling up. The next line you're going to see, the, uh, the sales tax line is the pig. Yeah, sales taxes, we're all these pretty colors, they're all going to blend together. So now you see the government starts collecting their 3% paid sales tax. Watch that sales tax line as it starts to go up in the late 1960s, government spending starts to skyrocket all of a sudden. Through the late 1960s, but it's not keeping track with government spending. Then comes 1970, we'll have a, Repu a Republican governor named William Cahill. He raises the sales tax from 3 to 5% and state spending continue. He also passes the lottery. When they passed the lottery, you know what they said that was going to do? It was going to help keep seniors in their homes. They said, you watch every news story. They increase the sales tax, help keep seniors in their homes. Pass the lottery, help keep seniors in their homes. 1972, the New Jersey State Support Club begins to come out with a series of decisions we now call the Abbott decisions, of which there have been 27. Suddenly, the basis of paying for education through local property taxes and that local control of education is no longer fair or equitable. Suddenly those urban manufacturing powerhouses that once a model for the rest of the world, they become what's called a special needs district. And according to the Supreme Court, we have to provide extra funding to those areas. They can't rely on property taxes. They have for the past 180 years. In fact, in uh, 1959, 
Newark's public school, Clay Hip High School, public high school, was ranked one of the top ten high schools in the United States of America. But by 1970, the New Jersey State Supreme Court says, well, this thing about property tax is it really fair. We want to see more state spending on education. That decision is passed. It's a series of appetite decisions. Watch the lines of pink and red and the property tax line, which is the blue line, as they're continuing to spiral up. 1973, the New Jersey State Supreme Court comes back with another decision. They tell us that, you know, this thing, fair market, free market housing thing, um, we don't have enough low-income housing in our urban areas for those people in need. And every town should be required to build their share of affordable housing as if they know where and how we need that. That's called the Mount Laurel decision. 1975 comes along, Brendan Byrne is the governor. The state Supreme Court orders New Jersey to increase funding to the special needs district or they will shut down the school system. That separation of powers that was so critical to America in the formation of our nation does not give one branch of government power over another. The governor of the state of New Jersey and the executive and the legislative branch in 1975 had the ability to tell Brendan Byrne to simply go pound salt. We appreciate your opinion, court, but you're wrong. We're the legislature. They didn't. They all bought into this whole concept and they gave us an income tax. When they passed the income tax, and folks go back and read the newspaper articles, politicians said this is wonderful because it's going to fund education on the local level, we're going to cut property taxes, and we're going to keep seniors in their homes. <laughs> That's what they said. 1976, now you have the red line of state appropriations, the pink line of property taxes, the blue line of, I'm sorry, the pink line of the sales tax, the blue line of property taxes, and the green line of the new state income tax. Watch state spending on this chart as it begins to spiral up 8, 10, 12 times the rate of inflation. The cost of government in New Jersey and the growth of government is staggering. It grows in leaps and bounds through the 1970s, and massive amounts of funding through an a redistribution. By the way, the income tax that was passed was basically a flat tax. It was 2 and 2.5%. Two and 1980, Tom Kane becomes governor. 1981, the state Supreme Court hands down its second Mount Laurel decision. It says not only should towns be required to allow its fair share, fair share of low-income housing, if need be, they have to pay to build it. Um, and by the way, the next Mount Laurel Abbott decision, I'm sorry, the next Abbott decision in early 1980 says that not only do you need to provide extra funding to those so-called special needs school districts, you need to fund those schools to the level of the highest spending school district in the state of New Jersey. So if Anglewood Cliffs or Saddlebrook or Rich is spending X amount, that's what the special needs districts need to get an additional funding from our income tax. If you're a middle income town, you're down, doesn't matter. You're out of luck. You spend what you want to spend. You pay your local property taxes. 1983, Tom Kane has to comply with the state Supreme Court. Well, I don't know if he had to, but he did. By raising the sales tax to 6%, the top end income tax to 3.5%, we now have progressive income tax, and spending in New Jersey in the 1980s is skyrocketing across the board. Come 1990, Governor Jim Florio, largest tax increase in state history. He has a top end income tax rate of 6.5%, giving us the most progressive income tax for the nation. Raises the sales tax to 7%, the highest in America. And by the year 1991, New Jersey has the highest property taxes in the nation. But Jim Florio says at his press conference that when you pass his tax package, it's going to make sure that we keep seniors in their homes. <laughs> now it's 1990. New Jersey has the worst taxes in the country. We begin our economic decline. We are now no longer leading the nation in economic growth. We're beginning to slip from 1 to 2 to 10 to 15 to 5. Jim Florio loses re-election, we elect a Republican governor. Of course, with this Republican governor, we're going to turn the state around, right? Governor Chris Christie gives us the Comprehensive Education Funding Act. Chris Whitman. Christie Whitman. That's right, I get my Christie's complete. Gets the Comprehensive <laughs> Education Act, and spending continues to increase, and distribution continues to increase, and just when you thought it was bad enough, they come back in 1998, and an organization called the Education Law Center says, well, you know, we need to have government-funded nursery schools in those special needs districts. But wait, 
Constitution says we educate children between the ages of 5 and 18. That doesn't include 3 and 4 year olds in our own Constitution. The state puts up an argument, a rather vapid one, and we lose. And the court orders in 1998 that we fund half-day nursery school programs in these Abbott districts because the court says, well, you can't really start an education at five unless you start at three. That's how they interpret the simple numbers five to 18. 1998, the number, the amount of money in the New Jersey state budget for government-funded nursery schools was zero. The following year, they go back to court again. They said the half day is not good enough. We want full day nursery schools in these so-called after districts paid for by taxpayers. And of course, they win again. Today, folks, the cost of a nursery school education for a three-year-old in Asbury Park, New Jersey, according to the State Department of Education, is $26,700 per child, more than a Rutgers University education with housing. My wife's a nursery school teacher in a Catholic school in Elmwood Park where the tuition is $3,800. The line item in the state budget this year is just shy of a billion dollars for government funded nursery schools. But it didn't stop there. 1999, Governor Christy Whitman comes along and she says, well, you know, we, the court tells Governor Whitman, well, these towns, these cities can't possibly build their own school buildings. Up to that point in American history, we built every school building in every city and town through local initiatives, local property tax dollars, just like that school building in Begoda in 1895, and just like every other school building in the state of New Jersey. Up until 1999, when the New Jersey State Supreme Court suddenly says, well, that's unfair. We need to provide funding to build school buildings in the Abbott districts. So Governor Christy Whitman complies by introducing an $8.6 billion bond issue to construct schools in the Abbott districts without approval of the voters. Well, wait a minute. The 1844 Constitution was never changed. You can't borrow money like that without voter approval. The state's debt in 1999 was $7 billion. That was money approved by voters. This was going to double state's debt overnight. So we sued. We went to the state Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, sorry, we're the state Supreme Court, and we say you need to do this and violate our own constitution. We had a Republican governor, Republican Senate, Republican Assembly, Republican State Supreme Court justice. Folks, don't think the fleecing in New Jersey by the Democrat Party. It's a bipartisan fleecing. So we had a bipartisan solution. They borrowed $8.6 billion. The largest bond issue in American history by any state, period. This one is out to voters. When the court ruled against the right of voters to vote on this massive bond issue, Chief Justice uh, Deborah Ports got up and said in 2001, that today, this is an antiquated clause, and that today Wall Street has safeguards in place against reckless borrowing with organizations like Moody and Standard & Poor's. That's what she said. Today, New Jersey's debt is just shy of $50 billion in the last 12 years. The year 2000 comes. Now, where was America in the year 2000? You know, the Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal and Fraser Institute, every year for, for several decades, published what's called the um, Freedom Index. Um, and it's a, a measure using a number of variables of every country's economic freedom, based on the rule of law, how taxes are, are done, uh, property rights, uh, et cetera, regulatory environment, et cetera. And in the year 2000, America was ranked as the third freest, most prosperous nation in the world behind Hong Kong and Singapore. Third. To me, not good enough. So. Christy Whitman leaves office in 2001. We get a guy named Jim McGreevy. I don't know if you remember him. <laughs> 2002, Jim McGreevy has this idea. He's going to have a millionaire tax. He's going to raise the top end income tax rate to 8.97%, the highest in the nation, the most progressive. I went down, I was a mayor at the time. I went to the War Memorial for his big thing. And they had these three, there's, in the War Memorial, there's three aisles that go down to the stage with a microphone in each one, so mayors and elected officials. So I get up to the middle aisle, he doesn't want me to speak each other, but finally he goes, all right, we'll let, he knows me, we'll let Steve speak. And here's what, here's what Jim McGreevy got up, and folks, you can still find this on, he got up and he said, by passing the millionaire tax, we're going to guarantee that we keep seniors in their homes. 
And I got up to the microphone and I finally said, Governor, I'm going to predict that within one year this money is going to sink into the black hole of state spending and you're not going to keep any seniors in their homes. And that's exactly what happened. Then we got John Corzine, and he raised the sales tax 1%, and he raided another surcharge on upper income wage earners. And spending continued. And then Governor Christie came into office, and one of the first things he was confronted with the state Supreme Court ordering another half a billion dollars in funding for the Abbott districts. That brings us to now, to the present. Where are we? New Jersey now has the worst taxes in the nation the highest property taxes in America. We rank first in outward bound migration. We are ranked the worst state in the nation to start a business. And we now have one of the nation's four top highest unemployment rates in the country. <clears throat> That's what government policy got us, folks. But while we were doing this in New Jersey, while we were watching our economic freedom diminish, what happened to the rest of the world? I want to take you on a little trip around the world. This is pretty fascinating. Um, you know, there are, there are four virtues to economic freedom. Oh, I'm sorry. Right, right, right. Thank you, Laquan. You know, when you look at the Economic Freedom Index that I told you about, the Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal divide the world into two columns. Column A and column B. Column A being the economically free nations, column B the not economically free nations. How many people in this room would choose to live in a column B country? Not one. Shocking though, I've been around the entire world. I've been to Hanoi, I've been to Cambodia, I've been to China, South America, Africa. It's shocking to learn how many people would choose voluntarily to say they want to live in a colony country. I've been face to face with them, toe to toe with them. Somebody just said why? The reason is they don't believe that anybody should shine. That there are many people who believe that we all should live at the same level of economic dependence and economic suffering, and no people should stand head and shoulders above another. And that's something you learn in other countries where you haven't been taught about freedom and individual liberty. Column A countries versus column B countries. But there's four merits to free market capitalism that make those column A countries that I'm going to prove to you tonight. And my goal tonight is when you leave here, you're able to talk about these issues with, your, with other voters going into the November election, because I think these issues are at stake. Capitalism delivers more freedom, more prosperity, more health and safety, more, more freedom, more prosperity, more health and safety, what? And peace, yeah. Um, peace, prosperity, health and safety. That's a big claim to make, isn't it? Peace, prosperity, health and safety and freedom. Um, but I'm going to prove it. I'm going to start by taking you to a little country called Chile. And the reason I want to go there is that Mir is exactly the opposite of what we did. In the 1970s, Chile was one of the poorest nations in South America. It was a column B country, one of the poorest in the world. When a new a dictator named Augusta Pinochet, backed by the American CIA, took control of Chile um, in desperate situations, and he had to rebuild the country on the verge of total economic collapse, total collapse. And he brought down a guy named Milton Friedman. An American economist named Milton Friedman and his group of economists called the Chicago Boys to rebuild Chile. And the Friedman people went down and they told Pinochet and his parliament, the first thing you need to do is denationalize businesses. Yet yeah, government run businesses. The government owned the automobile industry, sound familiar? The government owned the oil, they owned, and they denationalized businesses. They also uh, unnationalized the healthcare system. But they had a major step that they took, it was very controversial. And it was on the very day in 1980 that Ronald Reagan was being sworn in as President of the United States. The very day he put his hand on that Bible and raised his hand. And the Chilean parliament voted to privatize Social Security. The Social Security system in Chile was virtually identical to ours and like ours that had been going broke. And of course with the idea of moving towards a private individually held Social Security account the left went nuts. They said, Chile is 60% illiterate. How do you rely on Chilean workers to manage their own investments in the free market, the capitalist free market? Chileans had a choice. They chose from one of six IRL mutual funds. They were all based on the US, by the way. And they were relatively low risk. They were not high risk gambling funds. But they were still free market mutual funds. Or 
the Chileans could stay in the current system. And they knew when they retired, they'd get whatever. In the next two years, 95% of those illiterate Chileans voted to go into the privatized social security system. They began to invest their money just like we do. They put in their contribution to the mutual fund they chose. Their employer would match it. And uh, this, the left said it was going to be the total collapse. People were going to be poor. Well, what did happen? As of last year, Investment Business Daily reported that the average Chilean over the last 31 years investing in those markets has experienced an average 9.3% annual return on their investments, even with stock market collapse. Today, Chile, once the poorest nation in South America, is now the wealthiest nation in South America. That nation is debt-free. Um, they have an unemployment rate of about 4.8%. They continue to be on the economic growth curve. They are the world's best private sector savings country in the world, with Chileans building wealth every day. And when a Chilean worker takes out their passbook, social security booklet, and looks at their value, they know that if they die, that money goes to their kids with no inheritance tax and no estates tax, and they continue to build wealth on top of wealth on top of wealth. The Chilean model is a phenomenal success, but the American press suppresses that. We don't have American politicians enough guts to advance it. The worst part about this, folks, is that as we're sitting here right now, this year, the Chinese government, where there is no such security, has a delegation in Chile of economists and politicians examining this model. They're considering implementing it in China. Where would China be 30 years today when 4 billion Chinese start swirling away those yen week after week, month after month, year after year? And where does that put the United States of America? Chile is now ranked as the seventh freest and most prosperous nation in the world since being a column B country only 31 years ago because of adopting our principles. Um, interesting thing, every year I do a Milton Friedman lunch and I, I wanted to get some of the economists, Milton died, but I wanted to get some of his Chicago boys who had been to Chile to come speak at our luncheon. I found out they all stayed there um, and didn't come back. That's a fact. Um, <laughs> but you know, one of the things I said is peace, prosperity, health and safety and freedom. Health and safety? How do you say that? Well. In 1970, 125 out of every babies born in Chile would die in childbirth. By the year 2003, that number would drop to 8. So even the most vulnerable amongst us benefit in a free market economy. But if you look around the rest of the world, you look at those column A, column B countries, in a column B country, an average 70 out of every, hundred, every thousand babies born die in childbirth. In the column A countries, the number is 6. Yet people chose to live in column B countries. I'm going to take you to a little other place called New Zealand. Remarkable case study. New Zealand was in economic collapse in 1981. They had big government subsidy programs. They had heavy income redistribution schemes, corporate income tax. And in 1982, a new conservative government took control of the nation of New Zealand, which is on the verge of uh, defaulting on its world bank loans. Um, massive unemployment. The first problem that the new New Zealand government faced, and this was remarkable, is New Zealand's communication system, telecommunication system, was run by the government, it was part of the post office, and it was a total failure. In New Zealand in 1982, if you wanted to make a phone call, it was not uncommon to wait 30 minutes just for a dial tone. Um, you had a choice of two phones, white and black, both had a dial, and it would take three to six months to get a phone even installed in your house. One of the first things the New Zealand government did was privatize New Zealand Telecom and invite competition. New Zealand Telecom was sold in 1983 for $4 billion to outside consortium, and other companies were encouraged to compete. The left went nuts. They said, this is the end of communications. New Zealand Telecom employs 23,000 government workers. These people are going to be out of work. Well, they weren't all wrong. In a couple of years, the employees of New Zealand Telecom dropped from 23,000 to 7,000. The competition rolled into place. Investors put $4 billion into New Zealand Telecom. Other companies moved in. Today, in New Zealand, New Zealand uh, telecommunications industry employs some 35,000 workers, up from 23,000. The cost of a phone call in New Zealand is down 60%. And according to the technology industry, New Zealand has now the world's best and most advanced telecommunications system outpaced the United States of America. And high-speed internet, internet and phone systems and services we don't even know exist yet in this country. Number one in the nation.
But New Zealand had another big problem back then. They heavily subsidized the farm industry. Overnight, they ended farm subsidies. Now, New Zealand's an agricultural country. Opponents said this is a mess. You know, farmers are going to go bankrupt. Half farmers are going to go bankrupt. New Zealand's economy is going to collapse. Not quite. Some two years or three years later, the total was about 1% of farmers that went bankrupt. Today, with no reliance on government subsidies, New Zealand is the world's number one, tiny New Zealand, no bigger than New York State, is the world's number one exporter of dairy products, outdistancing the U.S. They rank every year in the top two and three in beef, poultry, and fish. You go into a restaurant today, seeing New Zealand lamb on the menu is pretty common because they produce the greatest lamb in the world. See, when New Zealand farmers learned how to compete in the world and keep good customers and not rely on government, they become the world's top agricultural industry. Today, tiny New Zealand that was bankrupt 30 years ago was a column B country is ranked as the world's fifth freest and most prosperous nation. So, you know, we go around the world and we see other countries buying into doing what we did that made us so prosperous Well, we went in the wrong direction. Well, well, direction. well folks, there's four things that you need to have a vibrant food market economy right here in the United States, right here in New Jersey. Personal choice versus collective choice. The market decides not the government. Protection from aggression by others. And the ability to enter the marketplace. Personal choice versus collective choice means millions of us make decisions every day on what's best for us and our individual self-interest and our individual needs. That we're not steered in that direction. Well, in the last five years, we've seen an all-out assault on personal choice on a scale never been seen before in the United States of America. You know what that is? The government take over our health care. Government bureaucrats getting between us and our x-ray technician. Forget our doctors. Our doctors, our x-ray technician, our pharmacists, and every single, every day in the millions of decisions we make. Personal choice versus connected with choice. And that, of course, has led to the uncertainty in business growth in this country and the future of America's health care industry and the cost to employers. The market decides, not the government. I'll give you a prime example of that right now. You're watching the cost of food going up every week in food stores. You're seeing it in meat. You're seeing it in every single product. Anybody who shops here knows that. Um, New Zealand ended farm subsidies. Our farm bill this year is the largest farm bill in American history, almost a trillion dollars. With a big portion of that going to subsidize corn production for ethanol. And when you divert corn production and make it profitable, so farmers now take fields that they would have used to grow spinach or turnips, and instead they grow corn because the government's going to subsidize that corn. You see a reduction in other products going to the marketplace, and you have increase in the course of corn. Add to that the unpredicted uh, drought, and the course of food skyrockets as the government intervenes in the marketplace, and we pay for it in a number of ways. So that's the difference between the market being allowed to decide <coughs> versus the government. Um, Protection from aggression by others. This is a remarkable, folks. When we talk about protection from aggression by others, we think in terms of war and crime. But there's another type of aggression. I told you I've been around the world. I've spoken to UN delegates. I've spoken to key leaders in other countries. <clears throat> and they envy us very much. Um, aggression by others shows itself in other forms. The little UN plan out there called Agenda 21. Aggression by others. Aggression by others is when UN delegates want to suppress our land use rights, uh, undermine the value of our property, the ability to use your property rights. And if you don't believe that, I've been to two of the last three UN conferences on Agenda 21 and climate change, Copenhagen and Mexico in December 2010. When I was down in New Mexico, I spoke to these people, and they are fanatics. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. I'm sorry if it sounds radical. They are fanatics. Here's one of them in this picture. Let me explain what this is. In front of the UN delegation meeting at the Moon Hotel, this fabulous, gorgeous, overly priced hotel in Cancun, is this UN delegate standing outside the main entrance. I took this picture. She's holding up a UN flag. You see the flag at her feet in the mud? That wasn't a mistake. That was deliberate. It was clear. It was in your face. The American flag in the mud. Aggression by others comes in a lot of different forms, folks, and we need to be aware of that. And we need to have politicians courageous enough to stand up against that assault on our property rights and our nation's wealth. 
And then, of course, the ability to enter the marketplace. And this is my favorite. I was a businessman in New Jersey for many, many years. My good friend John Stossel did a program several months ago. He talked about how in uh, the United States, it's an average 45 to 60 days for business to get the permits it needs to start a business. In Hong Kong, it's eight hours. You wonder why Hong Kong is such a vibrant country. The ability to enter the marketplace. I have a stark sort of visual of that. Remember a country called Vietnam? Well, we might have lost the war in Vietnam, but I can tell you our ideas are, are striving there, are, are thriving. I went to Vietnam in 2004. Um, it's part of the work I was doing as a delegate from Bergen County as an advancing person. And I went to a place called Hanoi, the seat of Ho Chi Minh, the center of communism. And in Hanoi City, there's a square called Lenin Square. In the middle of Lenin Square is this big statue of Comrade Lenin. He's got his fist up in the air, and he's holding the Communist Manifesto under his arm. And all around the base of the statue, we've got 18 high, and all around the square are all these booths and tables, and they're selling off knockoff coach bags, Levi jeans, Marlboro <laughs> cigarettes, total free market, free floor. And all I could think is, like, they didn't need a permit, and boy, if this was New Jersey, it would be a zoning official's fantasy to give out tickets. They weren't giving out tickets. They were not giving out tickets. They were encouraging their people to do business. I traveled overland for a couple of weeks across Vietnam, and I visited villages, and I pulled into Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City now, one evening at around sundown, and that place was lit up like a pinball machine. Um, I thought it was Las Vegas. The two biggest buildings were the Prudential Life Building and the Metropolitan Life Building. As Vietnam emerges into the free market, their two biggest markets are cell phones and life insurance as they prepare for the future. So, you know, we might have lost the war, but Vietnam is at peace now with its traditional neighbor warring uh, countries of China and Cambodia for the longest period of time in 500 years. Not because of diplomacy, but because they're striving for an economic liberty. Still a lot of bad sentiment about the U.S., but they're moving in the right direction. But I'll give you one more stark visual. This is a visual, a nighttime satellite picture of a pretty famous piece of land. You know what that is? The veterans in this room, it's Korea. This is a night, a daytime visual of the North and South Korea. North Korea is a column B country, South Korea is a column A country. The next visual is Korea by night. That satellite picture can be taken any evening. North Korea, column B country, is dark and dismal. South Korea lit up bright and inviting even from space. That's the difference between a column A country and a column B country. Everybody in North Korea lives at the same level of suffering. Down in South Korea, some people shine, some people don't. Everybody has the opportunity. I think that picture demonstrates the difference between being in a column A and a column B country, folks. I'm here tonight because it's my goal in life to make sure the lights on this country don't dim over time, which is exactly what's happened. I told you in 2000, New Jersey, the United States ranked as the world's third freest and most prosperous nation. It wasn't good enough back then. The Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal came out with their 2011 report. The United States of America ranked in 2011 as the world's 10th freest and most prosperous nation, dropping seven places in 10 years, with Chile, once a column B country, ranking at about seven, New Zealand number five, Hong Kong and Singapore continually be the most free and most prosperous nations in the world. We're on the verge of dropping out of number, number 10. And that's not because of Barack Obama alone. He's adding to that. There was many years before that of increased government spending to help push in that direction. But Barack is inciting it even further, make no doubt about it. So what happened? Well, there's been three key components. You know, in 1961, back when they started saying New Jersey needed higher taxes to cut property taxes, 11% uh, of Americans relied on government welfare programs for about 21 million people, not including Social Security. When I talk about wealth, Social Security is not welfare. That was 11% of 21 people in 1961. By last year, that number would drop to 21% of Americans, or 67 million people, one out of every five Americans, relying on government welfare programs. One out of every five. Remember what I told you about China? They don't have any social security. Forget welfare and food stamps. They feed themselves. Um, 
And while we saw this explosion of the welfare state, we've watched government spending skyrocket over the past 40 years. The spending of the federal government from 1970 to today has been 10 times the increase of the, of the median household income. Government spending has risen 10 times. Government spending, which was traditionally 16% of GDP, over the last decade or so has averaged 20%, and last year was 24.6% of our whole gross domestic product. Tax revenues can't keep up with those spending levels without destroying our economy. Thirdly, the national debt continues to skyrocket at ghastly amounts. Add to that state and federal spending. So with these trends towards spending and debt and government reliance on welfare programs, what does that mean? Well, according to our friends at the Heritage Foundation, the Wall Street Journal, and the Fraser Institute, by the year 2020, only eight years away, the United States is expected to drop to number 15 in the world for its most prosperous nation. While other countries continue to surge past us. Um, and that's where it's brought us to. Um, we have a choice in the months and the weeks to come to put this nation in a new direction, to put our state in a new direction. So now that I've depressed the hell out of you, <laughs> what's the good news? Well, go back to everything I told you. New Jersey, our nation, has these phenomenal resources. We have far greater resources at our fingertips than New Zealand or Chile did. In a short 30 years, two nations that were column B countries on the verge of total economic collapse in 30 years alone through good government policy and sound conservative leadership catapulted themselves ahead of the U.S. Chile now is one of the greatest destination countries in the world for retirees. They have a GDP growth in New Zealand is over 10%. Unemployment in Chile about 4%. Continues to be that way. We can do the same thing. The economy responds rapidly, it responds very quickly to good economic policies, and it will do so again. The state of New Jersey would have given that opportunity, and so will the nation. But we as citizens have an opportunity and have a responsibility more than ever before in our lifetimes. And I've been through a lot of elections. I was a yapper for Reagan, and every election is the most important in our lifetimes. I think this truly is. That we need to send the message to the White House, and by the way, we need to send the message to the Republican Party, that we are tired of your compromising and your weak leadership, that we want to see America not number 10, not number 5, not number 15, number 1 in the world. Yeah. Number 1 in the world. And we should settle for nothing less than the gold medal in economics. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much. I'd like to open for questions and then just a brief announcement. By the point, you have any questions? Any questions? Any questions on anything? Not anything. I think that uh, our country is being stifled from not being allowed to use our resources. Right? Yeah, and that goes back to aggression by others and UN initiatives to suppress America's productivity and redistribute our wealth. Um, and we're already seeing the impact of just being able to drill for natural gas in Pennsylvania and how our gas bills are dropping. And they hate it. So you're, you're absolutely right. By the way, while well, we're stopping coal mining in the United States, China's digging for coal and building a coal power plant about every 30 days, burning dirty coal. Yeah. Steve? Yes. Although this is a general question, you can answer it any way you want. How can the common everyday person be effective in making change. Okay, I'll give you something you can do right now. I was going to have Laquan talk about it. You can come to our phone bank at 275 Route 35 in Red Bank and you begin to make focused phone calls at undecided voters and educate them on the issues. That's one thing you can do right now. You can learn how to use Twitter. You can write letters to the editor. You can tour talk radio show. You can take the information I'm giving here today, you can translate it into sound bites, and you can engage your neighbors in neighbor to neighbor, door to door, hand to hand, participation in the democratic system while we still have one. And that's everybody's obligation. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you agree? Uh, hi. I'd like to ask a question about the Abbott district. I was surprised, uh, I thought I was shocked, when you mentioned 
that the, the schools in the Abbott district have to be funded to the same, so that they can have a school as good as the best schools in New Well, Jersey. funded to that level, that doesn't that necessarily level. mean that creates that value because of the massive sweeping corruption, the number of, you know, there's over, uh, there are over 300 teachers in Newark earning over $100,000 a year right now. Newark, the Abbott districts in New Jersey are the most expensive school districts in the nation. Spending per student average is twenty-five to thirty-three thousand a student. That's before debt service on school construction. Unfortunately, the real tragedy is we'd all be thrilled if these kids were coming out with outstanding education, and they're not. But they're not they're, even being educated. They're not even. It's, it's an absolute disaster for the young people there. A generations have gone through that school system, come out without an adequate education, even after the massive spending. There's only one answer to the problem with those corrupt school systems: that school vouchers are giving parents a choice of where they have their kids educated. But my question really hasn't ended. What happens to the schools that are in the middle? The people where you have, a, where the uh, you still have a, a substantial amount of money to the state, but they only get a few cents back on every That's dollar. That's yeah, like sort of middle income communities like my own Pagoda, right. like Farmingdale, so, yes, where so you pay you approximately uh, 85, 90, 95 percent of schools is paid for by local property taxes, and approximately 80 percent of your income taxes are redistributed to. Abbott districts. Yeah, it, it's a tra tragic, it's one of the major reasons for New Jersey's economic decline. Well, I know that it's, it's the result of the judicial system that's doing that. Yes, it what is. What is the legislative department? The legislature doing doesn't have the guts to do anything about it. Um, there is a bill called the Fair School Funding Act, which would require that money be distributed equally on a per student basis, which would require um, that, you know, a town produce a quality education. My, my plan is if you know, a community can't provide a quality education with the same funding as everyone else. They should be required to give a voucher to the parents of those children and let them go to school of choice. Let's drive real competition. You saw it worked in New Zealand, it worked in Chile. Competition works in America. Yes, ma'am. It seems that the balance of power somehow has failed in our system, you know, with the balance of the judiciary, legislative, and executive branches. And I'm just wondering, how, you know, how can we reinstate controls over, over the, like the judiciary. Is, isn't there, is there a way to yeah. these judges? Or you have to have a legislature that wants to. It's a legislature. See, yeah, I've them. watched these guys capitulate to the court. Well, the court made us do it. Mm -hmm. The Mount Law was, oh, the court made us do it. Abbott thought, oh, the court made us do it. It's a great way to pass liberal, uh, unpopular laws and blame somebody else for doing it. So you blame a bunch of unelected black old oligarchs who legislate from the bench and don't have to worry about re-election because they're appointed for life. So, two, two more questions. Two more questions? Yeah. 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 How much has um, the advancement of unions devastated our abilities to function? Well, it's a fabulous question. Remember that sales tax that was passed in 1965? There was no NJA before 1965. There were things around the state called teacher's guilds. You might remember the term they were called. They were basically professional organizations. With the passage of the sales tax, uh, the following year, the NJA was formed. Uh, yeah, and then since that, the unions have wielded massive power uh, in organizing on the ground and influencing legislation and controlling the state. My goal for our organization, Americans for Prosperity, is to recruit, educate, and activate as many citizen activists on the ground as there are government worker union members in the state of New Jersey. Good. That's my career goal. So they've played a massive role. So yes, sir. and the governor has made some good steps in, uh, on, on the pension issue, but there's still a lot more to do. Yes sir? Steve, yes. Yes. what's your honest assessment of our governor? You think he's the man that we all I, I think time will tell. Um, you know, he is dealing with a Democrat legislature, which makes life difficult. But you can't often tell for months or years the real success of policies. But apparently he's been chosen to be the keynote speaker of the National Convention, so people have confidence in him. So we should keep supporting him? You want to support the good things and not the bad. I mean, you can't just blanket support anybody no, I mean, anything they do. You know, I, I don't. I mean, there are things. I, Ronald Reagan is my hero. I don't support everything he did. 
You know, so you want to support. It's the issues you want to support, not the person. Yeah. Folks, thank you for being here. I want to introduce our fuel community of Quad Oceans to tell you about a few of the programs coming up, the things you can do. Thank you for having me again. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the programs that we're doing right now that helps you turn some of that, that passion into actual action. One of the things that Steve mentioned is our phone banks. We're in four phone banks across the country, I mean across the state right now. And we're doing it to help not necessarily influence, but be a part of the upcoming election. So that's something you can do. Um, as Steve said, there's one in Elmer right now and it's operating about five days a week. Uh, closer to November, it will be operating six to seven days a week. So, but I encourage you all to uh, get involved with that, even if you can only do an hour worth of time. Secondly, what we're doing is we're doing training sessions on Twitter. We found that that's a very effective tool in getting the message out and really creating trends um, and talking points about certain topics. So again, that's something that we uh, we do as well. If you go on our AFP website, you can find uh, where our next Twitter and training event will be. And I encourage you all to attend some of those as well. Of course, after, the, after today's meeting, I'll be able to stick around for a little bit and I'll have my business card. And Steve will be around to answer some questions, tell you a little bit more about some upcoming events that we have. So I encourage you all to come out and talk to us and support AFP. Thank you. Wow, that was amazing, wasn't it? Would you come up with the good men of our church? We would like to close our meeting out uh, with a word of prayer. Just before we do that, could we all stand together and sing God Bless America? Would you sing that with me, ready? God bless America. close to home and all over America. And, but Father, uh, in, in light of all that we've heard tonight and um, seemingly hopeless, we know that uh, no matter what fight we fight, if you are not our leader, um, all is for known. And as our pastor spoke tonight, that uh, we are your people and we're called by your name. And Lord, I pray tonight that you would help us to humble our hearts. Help us all to come back here. Have a new start this Sunday. Uh, humbling our hearts to come here and worship you corporately. Humbling our hearts enough to come and pray to you and seek your face, seek your direction. And Lord, knowing in our hearts fully that you will heal our land. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit and all that he helps to lead and guide us to do. And I pray that he would work in every heart here tonight. For Jesus' sake and in his, in his name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.